Cupid at Forty by Mrs. Florence Skirton Tuttle At last, it begins to look more like a Christmas tree and less like a cemetery evergreen, Miss Winslow exclaimed, stepping back in the artist fashion to survey her work and feeling her aesthetic nature sensuously soothed by the sight of green-fringed, tinsel-laden branches against the rich crimson of the library walls. I was born with an eye for backgrounds. She took up a fat wax cupid, silver-winged, and equipped with quiver and darts, and looked at him speculatively, before soaring up the step-ladder to place him at the apex of the tree. "'Have you shafts that will pierce the world-worn heart of forty? she inquired whimsically. "'And would you have loved Psyche, had she ceased to be perennially young? "'Old age! Ugh! Oh, she shivered daintily. "'Miss Winslow was a middle-aged belle. "'She was forty, and carried her years with an engaging lightness, "'which was the marvel of her set. "'She was rich, consequently popular to the point of envy, "'charming, and therefore possessed a few friends who loved her for herself. "'Yet on Christmas Eve, when all the world was sung by echoing bells "'into temporary tranquillity, Miss Winslow's heart was not at peace. "'Holidays are horrible resurrections to people who live alone,' she murmured. "'Resurrections of heart-wringing sorrows and ghosts of the past. "'I am glad that I insisted upon having the tree here, spinster though I am.' Ten nieces and nephews with their respective guardians will make the rafters ring, and Lester, in the role of family friend, will relieve the Christmas dinner from the narrowness of a strictly family affair. I trust that my spirits will have regained their usual mercurial ascendancy. They are much below freezing point now. Miss Winslow's unrest was indefinite and therefore intangible. Only a discontent which assumes a specific form may be coped with, Mary Winslow's life had been too active to permit of self-analysis, so she did not probe her mood, nor realize that pain sprang in her heart, as it must in the heart of every true woman, from the void which legions of friends only make more vacant, but which may be filled to overflowing by the magical presence of one. She had steadfastly refused all invitations to domicile with her married brothers, it would be very nice, she would admit, and the children would be brought up much better. Old maids are born disciplinarians. They never are overindulgent like grandparents. Grandparents should be seen and not heard. But you see, I enjoy too much being perfectly free. To appreciate liberty, one must have known slavery. Miss Winslow's early life had been spent in a bondage, which, though loving, had nevertheless held her enchained. The unconsciously selfish exactings of an invalid mother had sentenced her to the shadows of a sick-room and to an atmosphere heavy with drugs. When emancipation at last came, it was like breathing the pure sunshine for the first time. She took deep, invigorating draughts of the life of the world, enjoying her debut doubly because it had come nearly a decade late. And the world enjoyed her as much as she enjoyed the world— it was so accustomed to prematurely blasé types. What wonder it welcomed gladly one who was maturely young. The years might record her as a woman past the thirties. Spirits stamped her as a girl with a new-found capacity for life. When the souffle menu of society ceased to satisfy her, she traveled and beheld enthusiastically civilizations older than her own. The sight taught her to view life in its proper proportions, and to realize the microscopic part in the plan of the grand whole which her own smart set enacted. She found pleasure in collecting curios, tapestries, and pictures. Upon her return, unrest still remaining importunate, she secured occupation and a kind of satisfaction in a diversion welcomed by people whose incomes increase in a ratio beyond their ability to disperse them. She built a magnificent home, only those who know the delights and vexations of this form of diversion realize its absorption. Miss Winslow had her own ideas. So likewise had her architects. Her home must be characteristic, stamped, like her crested stationery, with the insignia of her personality. There was to be no such hideous deformity in it, for instance, she insisted, as a chandelier. 
the red library was lighted with swinging antique brass lanterns hung in each corner and glowing softly with the pressing of a single switch other rooms had sidelights or curious lamps one of them said to have belonged to a vestal virgin the andirons in her hall were adorned with winged golden dragons orlocks nefariously bribed from a venetian gondolier norway contributed a beautiful dark bearskin which was not treated to the ignominy of being trampled under foot but was stuffed and permitted to stand erect a savage guardian of the entrance hall each room represented a different period accurate in detail only to be secured after long historical research french and italian palaces had been explored and treasures purchased not for their intrinsic value but for the part they had played in the comedy or tragedy of the world lester had been a great help to her in building her home lester was her brother's intimate friend and an architect of established fame he enjoyed drawing her out to steal her ideas he said appreciating the rareness of her ingenuity and taste the friendship she enjoyed with lester was uncommon and a source of mutual satisfaction miss winslow's experience of men was large and not wholly to their advantage it was the inevitable penalty a woman with a fortune paid she described lester as an unusual man who was never in nor out of the way and who had no nonsense about him this last was intelligible to her intimates it meant that lester had never made love to her his good humor was unfailing his optimism of the brightest hue this last was not because he did not see the world's shadows but rather because he possessed that larger vision which sees also the world's sunshine and which obstinately refused to live anywhere but in it he elevated the ideal above the real in thought and tried to maintain the relationship in fact when success came he bore it without undue elation just as he had previously borne failure without undue despair he was beloved by the few whom his discriminating taste would admit to the valued privilege of intimacy and respected by all who would have liked to claim that distinction miss winslow's labors were interrupted by a ring at the doorbell and an inquiring voice in the hall soon after without presenting credentials lester appeared on the threshold of the library at a glance one felt that the scrupulously groomed man was unknown to marital responsibilities the unlined fresh-looking face bore the imprint of the irresponsible bachelor and clubman and if his eyes sometimes suggested that life had not yet granted that which was most subtle most satisfying most craved the philosopher's smile on the lips indicated the manner in which the knowledge had been born do you come in the role of santa claus miss winslow asked glancing at the presents for the children which lester and his servant were bringing in and falling into the usual banter with which she and lester were wont to play and did you dust the chimney on the way down no the modern santa claus comes in a horseless carriage with rubber tires he replied carrying with one arm the empire state express and placing it beneath the tree that explains the change in christmas i knew that it was not what it used to be no it's much better he asserted i tell you we have overdone it she reiterated what is christmas now in reality a time when the person who cannot extract some fun out of it would better examine his mental machinery he said taking off his gloves miss winslow scorned the rebuke it is a time she replied answering her own question which we forestall by working so hard that we are fit subjects for the rest cure when it gets here it is merry in anticipation and melancholy in fact oh of course when you remember every one who has ever bowed to you and all the inmates of the old ladies homes besides it is a time she continued when you receive a lot of things that you don't want and give away everything that you do i'd better take my gift home then he said stooping and picking up a square package it's only a first edition of shelley which which you happen very much to want she laughingly finished it was her turn to score 
don't ask me to take off my coat. I couldn't think of it, he said, divesting himself of the garment. I'm in a most unaccountable mood, she protested. You'll regret it if you stay. A few more regrets won't matter, he said, leisurely seating himself. Besides, you're only a sweet bell out of tune. She shook her head sadly at him. No, it won't do, Arthur. I'm not in a mood to be sugared. What is it all about, he asked, picking up a fierce-looking dagger, which had fallen to the humble estate of cutting magazines. I'm struggling under the startlingly new discovery that the moon is not made of green cheese, and, plaintively, you know I'm one of the few women who like my fromage green. Things are not what they seem. Oh, yes, they are. Your mood has gotten into your optics and tinged the lenses with blue. I feel as if life would be quite endurable if it were not for its pleasures, she continued. Golf is an elusive phantom. Cotillion's a torture. While as for people, she hesitated. Go on, he said encouragingly. Don't mind me. People are masqueraders, one and all. The good are wicked saints, and the bad are righteous sinners. I'll have to think before I decide in which class I'd rather be found. Go on, he said. I know there is more. I'm lonely, she replied obediently. That's nothing. I've been living that down for years. This barn of a house oppresses me. I warned you against making it perfection, said Lester unsympathetically. I have succeeded in building an establishment. I have discovered that what I want is a home. Lester's lips emitted a low sound which might have been an exclamatory whistle. Is it really as bad as that, he inquired? I am afraid she is taking life seriously. Making epigrams is a sure sign. No, laugh and grow thin has been my motto. I've made a study of it. So have I, with different results. What is the secret of your success, he interrogated. Oh, it's not a secret. Like everything else nowadays, it's only a state of mind. Which implies that mine is suffering from fatty degeneration, he inquired. You will suffer from something worse if you remain. I am really unmistakably savage. Besides, I must finish the tree. By all means, but don't send me away. It is such an incomparable pleasure to see someone else work. Besides, do you know that I have a peculiar, physical, Madame Blavatsky sort of feeling that if I went, I should be doing irremediable injury to us both? In short, I refuse to go. So you don't feel that four walls in the fashionably crowded part of the city constitute a home? They are so much expensive paint and brick, she replied. You can say, he said, homeless near a thousand homes I stood, and near a thousand tables pined and wanted food. Why will you persist in understanding one's mood? Miss Winslow asked grievously. You deprive one of the sweet misery of explaining. I feel as if this house were a museum. Everything has such an unused, creepy look. I have found that a home does not consist in having colonial and empire rooms, nor even in antiques like these, she waved her hands at the old mahogany of fashionably modern outline which adorned the library. Home lies in the spirit infused into it, and one woman's spirit, pathetically, will not cover a house of this size. There is one thing that I am seriously thinking of doing. I think I shall adopt an orphan child. An orphan asylum would fill it better, he commented. Miss Winslow went over to the table and lifted the cupid. Since you prefer me in a bad mood to anyone else in a holiday one, I must continue my work. What are you going to do with that dangerous boy? Lester asked, looking at the pink-faced cherub as she dangled him from a string held between finger and thumb. I am now about to hang Cupid, she said solemnly. How delightful! I have always wanted to be present at an execution. Besides, it's a fate I've often thought he deserved. You must have suffered a good deal at his hands, she said, looking sideways at him between half-closed lashes. That reminds me. I heard someone at the Hoyt's dance last night call you an artistic flirt. And what, may I ask, is a flirt? 
artistic or otherwise, Lester inquired with sparkling eyes. Miss Winslow thought for a moment. A flirt, she replied, is a man with a small capacity for loving every woman and a large incapacity for loving one. The laughter died from Lester's eyes. Do you believe that is true of me? he asked lightly. Miss Winslow did not reply. Do you really believe that of me? he asked more seriously. Miss Winslow moved uneasily. There was something in Lester's tone which she could not meet with the usual banter. Look at me, Mary, he said peremptorily. You can study the pattern of your rugs any time. Miss Winslow shot a swift glance at him, then lowered her lids again. Lester rose and came toward her. "'You have very pretty eyelashes. I have always admired them,' he said, standing directly in front of her. "'But I want you to look at me and tell me if you honestly believe I have a large incapacity for loving one woman.' Something new in his voice, something subtle and almost painful in the atmosphere, played havoc with Miss Winslow's usually well-adjusted mental processes. She felt silenced, paralyzed, almost afraid. When the silence became intolerable, being a woman of the world, she treated the occasion with the world's greatest emotional safeguard. She took refuge in a laugh. I impeach your power to catechize me, she said. Here, take your arch enemy Cupid and be revenged by hanging him high. He took the wax figure from her and stood as if in debate. Then he turned toward the tree and addressed the figure in his hand. Cupid, he said, I hang you with many apologies. I confess to a fondness for you, not shared by the lady of this manner. I shall suspend you high where you can keep a watchful eye upon her. Who knows, he broke off and ascended the steps. The universal God revolved slowly in midair in his new home on the tree, then settled into permanence of direction. See, Mary, Lester cried, looking over his shoulder. He is pointing his arrow at you. Have a care. As he said it, his foot, which was reaching backward for a lower step, miscalculated, and with a crash he fell heavily to the floor. Well, of all awkward brutes, he exclaimed, regaining a sitting position where he remained with one foot under him. The trick elephant in the circus could have done better. Miss Winslow's first inclination was to laugh. When Lester attempted to rise, however, and unconsciously emitted a groan, she flew at once to his side. Is it your foot? You've twisted and perhaps sprained it. Oh, if you had only gone before. Don't, Mary. Don't hit a man when he's down. You may think the fall was retribution, but I attribute it to another cause, he gave a glance at the cupid. That little rascal, I believe, knocked me down. He closed his eyes with pain. Miss Winslow's talent for emergencies came to the front. She summoned her man to help lift Lester to the couch, and then flew to the telephone and called a doctor. Her own physician responded. After the usual pullings, pinchings, and pressings, he cheerfully pronounced the wrench a very bad sprain. It will be a matter of weeks, though hardly, I hope, of months, he said amiably. You'd better have yourself moved where you can be made comfortable and be supplied with diverting companionship. These affairs are tedious at the best. He offered his further services, which Miss Winslow, catching a telegraphic message from Lester's eyes, declined, saying that her man could do everything necessary. In a few moments she was alone with her guest, who sat helpless as a child with bandaged foot, elevated upon a tabaret in front of him. Well, Miss Winslow said in some embarrassment, why did you not allow the doctor to accompany you home? Do you prefer the distraction of William's accent? Lester contemplated his wounded foot. Mary, he said, do you realize that we are facing a state of things? I realize that you are. Well, be unselfish and imagine that you are, too. 
do you think that a bachelor's apartment house without a woman in sight ideally fills the doctor's prescription of course i don't it is most unfortunate oh if your married sister did not live one hundred miles away yes or if i could be expressed to her you can have a nurse she suggested but you will have to eat and sleep and wink on schedule and you hate doing things by rule yes and if she were not pretty she would make one feel worse and if she were you'd fall in love with her not at all but there's no telling what would happen to her no a woman nurse i feel is an anomaly then why not have a man a man is a monstrosity i should be at liberty to throw boots and vigorous invectives at him but i am afraid i would be unfit for society at the end of the term no mary i see but one loophole fate has erected a signpost with a straight clear path for you and me for me she echoed feebly yes i have a proposition to make a most logical solution you wish to adopt some one i am in need of a home do you not see that providence has left a charge not on your doorstep but on your stepladder as it were no i don't she gasped this foundling he continued has every requirement which your orphan child could not possess you must have some one who understands your every peccadillo who will not laugh when you sigh or weep when you are merry who will not monopolize your favorite chair be bored with omar khayyam or sleep through the opera mary we are all only children of a larger growth listen to fate and save me from the doom of solitary confinement by adopting me did you sprain your brain as well as your ankle miss winslow inquired no my senses are intact but you don't mean you didn't intend she faltered i certainly did you always had unusual perspicacity you may catalogue me as number twenty five is it i have had the honour to make you what the lady novelist terms an honourable proposal of marriage miss winslow fell back in her chair what more rational solution of a difficult problem he continued you are lonely and wish to adopt some one i am sentenced to bachelor banishment for months you wouldn't like to think of me fuming and fretting existence away would you when you might have prevented it miss winslow leaned forward in her chair and quietly scanned his face then the blood flamed over her own tipping even her close-set ears with crimson yes he really means it she said musingly and with reluctance he has asked me to marry him for convenience sake and he does not realize how he has humiliated me yet that could be borne but to be disappointed in him one can never get used to that and i thought he understood me then at a low exclamation from lester oh i give you credit for not intending to pain me the awful part is not to know that you have do you realize what you have said i have heard of men who married to obtain a housekeeper it is a novelty to meet one who wishes a trained nurse lester's face flushed deeply he opened his mouth to refute the injustice but she would not let him begin no don't speak she said i am choking with the words i want to say she met his gaze now with eyes from which vehement indignation flashed and he sank back among the pillows of the couch how dared you she inquired with low forcefully distinct enunciation how dared you to speak to me of marriage and never speak of love do you think forty outgrows it she covered her hot cheeks with her hands let me say one thing more as again he attempted to check her of course we can't be friends after to-night the bonne camaraderie of our relationship is over you have forever spoiled it your going will make a void in my life i don't think i ever knew until to-night how large a place you filled her voice gave a little break which she quickly controlled you satisfied me because i thought you understood me but the one vital thing you did not understand let me tell you now 
that you may know why I am so stung. I, Mary Winslow, spinster, with face turned toward the setting sun, demand of the man who would win me absorbing, all-compelling love. I am not a woman to bestow myself. I must be one, and it cannot be done with a jest. Lester's face had grown white as he listened. Sometimes he closed his eyes as if trying to shut out sound. Sometimes the hands on his knees moved a little. When he spoke, his voice was entirely without the intensity of tone she had used. It was the conversational tone of a stunned man, finding refuge in conventional phrase, the ever-blessed law of habit which prevents human tension from being stretched too far. "'I can't tell you how I regret having pained you,' he finally said. "'It was the last thing I intended to do, and I am sorry not to have done well what I should like to have done the best of all. Yet, with a touch of whimsicality, I don't know that it is surprising. One can hardly expect a stage proposal from a man who has never made one before. Her eyes were fastened upon the tree. Her attitude indicated a polite but weary judge who was tolerantly waiting to hear what the defense might say. If I had not felt so deeply, I could have been more eloquent, he continued. We have played with words so long, it was hard to be serious even when I most wished. I must have taken it for granted that you knew that I loved you. Women are either amazingly astute or incredibly blind in such matters. Why did you suppose I had haunted your hearth for nearly ten years? I think it began then when your mother was taken away. He spoke simply, as if relating a narrative long familiar, and one that should not surprise his listener. You will wonder why I never told you. It was because you came into your heritage late. I would not try to take it from you. You found your girlhood years later than most women. While your mother lived, her health held you in a bondage of love. When you entered the gay world, it was a fairyland to you. Like a girl, you enjoyed each moment. I would not rob you of one. I followed your enthusiasms, your disappointments, your triumphs, waiting until pleasure should fall. I wished you to find for yourself that the pretty bubbles you chased turned to air when you grasped them. When I came to night, I knew immediately that the mood I had longed for had come. You were heartsick and filled with satiety. The apples of Sodom were bitter in your mouth. I was so happy I could have shouted. For Mary, he leaned forward and spoke rapidly, it was love your soul was crying for, love the deepest need of human life and what your heart was vaguely demanding mine had long been throbbing to give do you know to what heights of folly i have been led by this masterful passion do you know that i go blocks out of my way at night to pass your window do you know that i visit barbaric receptions for a glimpse of your face can you realize the pangs of jealousy i suffer when i find you monopolized by some young cub whom in fancy I cuff and throw out at the door? His eyes rested on her and held her with resistless power. Think of the men who have loved you. Did you fancy I did not know when you turned them away? Love is keen. Mary, you do care, or you would not have been so stung by my cursed flippancy tonight. Don't try to answer me now. I will go home and in spite of solitude my Christmas will be the happiest I have ever known. Think of what I have said, and remember, your happiness and mine are at stake. Oh, Mary, gift of God to me, prayer and creed of my life, give me the right before the world to worship. Mary, Mary, sweetheart, don't cry. Reaction from her indignation had left Miss Winslow quiescent. When Lester spoke, incredulity and then amazement swept over her followed by a peace which was subtle restful new when his words came faster and faster she felt herself swept along on their current and questioned not whither she was being borne after years of enforced repression it was blissful to let herself go that christmas eve her beautiful home 
her material possessions had seemed but a background which intensified the poverty of her heart she had unconsciously longed for those imperishable riches which now were laid at her feet and deeper than the knowledge of what she would receive was the certainty of what she knew she could give when lester's voice broke with its new tenderness her overtaxed nerves gave way and she sobbed like a child the sight restored him to the safe path of the commonplace and his next words were in the usual bantering tone well of all things that is the unkindest to cry when i cannot reach you is that handkerchief a flag of truce but he could not win her to smiles sob after sob filled the room the pitiful long-drawn sobs of childhood or of womanhood that retains the sensitive heart of the child if you do not wish to break my heart mary you will stop hurting me and come here at once the doctor's infliction was nothing to this mary i command you to come here then as she did not heed him he said in a voice in which each word was a caress mary i have waited years patiently for you see i will not look will you not come to me in my distress and obediently with face still covered like a little child she came end of cupid at forty by mrs florence skirton tuttle